1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, pardon me. 2 Corinthians 11. Have it up there on the screen. <clears throat> we started uh, this part of it last week dealing with the gospel as a contract. Dealing with contract law. The words that are in this book mean something. And you either agree to it or you don't agree to it. You either give your consent or you, you don't. You, th and that's how it is. And there are, there, just as in any contract, there are stipulations. Okay? God doesn't just... In, in Genesis 9, God swore that he would not ever destroy the earth with water. And he signed that contract with the bow that is in the cloud. Okay, that's his signature. That's his sign of his, uh, that he's not going to break that covenant. That covenant is an unconditional one. What does man have to do to not ever get flooded out again? Nothing. Okay? God just swore that oath, and he's keeping to it. The question is... <clears throat> And this is, boy, we could get into a debate. But the question is, is salvation an unconditional contract on either God's part or man's part? Is there something for man to receive salvation, eternal life? Is there something, a responsibility on man's part? Okay, that's the question. Okay, and I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay, so what is the terms then of God's offer of salvation as far as man's part? Believe. You believe, faith. Okay, if you don't believe, there's no, there's, you, you can't get, you can't be a recipient of that. God does not offer, now the, the term is I think universalism. That God just gives salvation then to everybody for nothing. Now the offer's there. To all man. But the question is, did God just give salvation to everybody, even if they don't believe? All right? A uh, conversation was held between Billy Graham and Robert Schuller. You know, the Our Power guy. Robert Schuller <coughs> believed that you could be a Muslim... And as long as you were a faithful Muslim, you would still go to heaven. And he had, he had a broadcast conversation with the Reverend Billy Graham, who in his later years, on this Our Power program, said that he believed that you could have faith in Allah, and that would still count for salvation. Joel Osteen talking with Oprah Winfrey, you know, Oprah, that great, conservative, Bible-believing, born-again, <clears throat> Satan worshiper, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, Oprah Winfrey, who says, who asked Joel Osteen, um, is Jesus the only way to God? And he said, yes, but there are many ways to Jesus which would include Islam, Buddhism, and other religions, all right? So while Osteen may have narrowed the entrance to God by Jesus Christ, he broadened the entrance to Jesus basically by any, any form of religion, I guess, that you picked would be okay. You could still... You could have access to eternal life as long as you believed in some sort of God. I don't know. But anyway, let, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> um, look at verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, and we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted. Those words there are contract law words. You are, you are the recipient of a spirit. Paul said in Ephesians 1 that that spirit was then the token of God's keeping his promise to us that, uh, what was the word used in Ephesians? 
Huh? Earnest. Yeah. That was God's earnest. God signifying that, yes, indeed, I'm going to keep my end of the contract by giving you my spirit. And that was God's earnest to us that he's going to fulfill the covenant until, until the time of fulfillment. All right? So you understand that even though you have agreed to the covenant, the covenant still has not been fulfilled in its final form. In other words, you don't have that new body yet. Okay? It's not yours yet. I mean, it's signed, it's agreed to, but there is, there is coming a, a fulfillment of the promise that you are sons of God and that you'll have the body of the sons of God. So anyway, <clears throat> the idea that if you accept another Jesus, if you receive another spirit, or if you accept another gospel, you cannot, you cannot have a contract. Let's say that you're a Major League Baseball player and you're going to sign for the St. Louis Cardinals. Okay? But then... You've got a contract, you sign a contract with Chicago Cubs. You cannot play for both teams. They will not let you play for both teams. Choose, choose this day, Cubby, who you will follow. Did you hear this guy? Blasphemy! <laughs> you're either going to play for the Cubs or you're going to play for the Cardinals. You go to the game, you're either going to root for the Cubs, you're going to root for the Cardinals. Amen? One or the other. There is no Cub Cardinal team. There is no, do what? Yeah. There is no Chrislam. There is no Christian Islam. That's two different gods with two different contracts or covenants Two different requirements. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot have two masters. Okay? And in this terminology, you cannot sign and agree to two covenants. It's either one or the other. Because God is a jealous God. He is very jealous. So, let's go to, uh, we looked a little bit last Sunday at the contract itself. And... Um, Let's just start here in Galatians 3.13. So open your Bible there. and We'll, we'll start there. It's where we ended last week. Let's start here. Galatians 3.13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be a man's covenant, Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Very important. Very important to keep in mind. All right? You, once it's confirmed, it can't, no man can un, disannul it. No man can add to it. If it's a covenant of faith, no man can add a work to it. No man can do that. It is, and it is strictly a covenant of faith. And faith strictly is not the performance of works. Faith brings about the performance of works. The evidence of your faith is that you, are, you will be doing God's will. That's the evidence. But it's not the contract itself. All right? So verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. And he's talking about his, his promise to Abram or to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham that in him that is in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And God would bless the seed of Abraham. Not seeds, multiple, but seed singular. The offspring of Abraham. And then the Bible tells us then that we are of the offspring of Abraham by faith. If we believe, like Abraham did. If you, 
If you believe the way Abraham did, then you get to be a participant of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Does that make sense? And what he's saying is, God made a promise to Abraham, and he said the law, which came 430 years after Abraham, the law cannot disannul that. The law cannot, cannot override and supersede the promise that God made to Abraham. His covenant with Abraham stands fast, and just because something else came along later, that cannot disannul the contract or the covenant with Abraham. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So, here's the rule. Contract law, rule number one. Once the contract is agreed to, it cannot be altered except by consent of both parties in writing. Now, turn to, uh, well, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. If you turn to Exodus 30, let's say, uh, 34, I want to say. Yeah, okay, Exodus 32, verse 15. Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God graven upon tables. So when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he came with a written contract in his hand. It was written by God. It was written in stone. It was graven on stone. And it was written on both sides of the tables, the tablets, as it were, meaning that it's been written, now it's in stone, it cannot be erased, and now that we've etched it in stone and we've written on both sides, there is no room to add anything to it. Moses does not come down with three tablets. He comes down with two, and only two. And the number of commandments were 10, not 11, not 12, not 15, not 100, okay? It wasn't anything like that. It was 10 commandments only. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. And that's, the, that's a picture of the contract. And here's, here's where we're at right now as far as what I'm, what I'm hearing from other churches. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, ooh, I'm, getting a, I'm getting a word from God. Yes, okay, I'll tell him. God said to receive his blessing, write a check to our ministry for $1,000, and you will receive God's blessing poured out on you. That is in addition to what's already been written here. If you want a blessing from God, according to the word, you can ask God, and he'll give it to you without you writing a check for $1,000. In fact, you got your bills paid, you slept in your house last night, you drove in your car this morning, you put on your clothes, you've already received the blessings of God. You already have them. Okay? Now, there might come along a time when you need a little bit more God's always gracious but the idea that I say that you have to do certain things in order to get a blessing from God or get some kind of financial deal with God or financial arrangement with God or whatever the fact that I throw that in that cannot disannul the contract that you already agreed to which is the new covenant um, you know in fact I think I have it up here uh, Revelation, where is my Revelation? Revelation twenty two eighteen. For I testify to every man, you turn there in your Bible, and you can write a little note here that says, here's, here's the contract. Revelation 22. God stipulates at the end of the contract that nothing can be added after these words. Okay? Now, I was listening to his quack, on the internet, <clears throat> and he said, he said, the book of Revelation was written somewhere around 60 A.D. 
And I'm going, that's not true. And I'm thinking, why did he say that? Then it dawned on me. He said it because if Revelation was written in 60 A.D., Paul was still in the process of writing his epistles at about that time. So John writes Revelation in 60 A.D., so let's say in 65 A.D., Paul is writing 1 Timothy. So at the end of Revelation, you have these words that nothing can be added to or taken away from the book of the prophecy of this book. If Revelation was written in A.D. 60, then obviously God did not mean that you could not add anything to the whole of the Bible. Because then Paul is still writing parts of the Bible after A.D. 60. Does that make sense? So in his mind, he, what, he's, what he's setting up everybody to believe is that you can't add to the book of Revelation anything after these words. But God is still giving his word out after A.D. 60. Okay? But we know by way of history that Revelation was not written until the 90s being the last book and the, and the final word that God is giving to man by way of the Holy Ghost, signifying that after these words, the Bible's done. It's the end of the contract. It's the last page. Lawyers will number their pages, won't they? On page 5 of your contract. Now on page 7 of your contract. Page 7 would be the last page. And you may have to initial all the pages on the corner. But on the last page, you got to sign it. Saying that you agree to everything written above your signature. And after your signature, there cannot be the addition of any words after your signature. You don't agree to that. Okay? So... He said, Revelation 22, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's contract law. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, like, oh, 1 John 5, 7, or Acts 8, 37, or whatever, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testified these things said, Surely I come quickly, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. And the word amen means we agree. Amen. That's our signature. You say amen. Jesus is the amen. He signifies that this is the end of the contract right here. So, um, let me show you this. Here's, here's what it would look like in a contract. This is the entire agreement between the parties. It replaces and supersedes any and all oral agreements between the parties, as well as any prior writings, modifications, and amendments to this agreement, including any exhibit or appendix, shall be enforceable only if they are in writing and signed by authorized representatives of both parties. In other words, no... I'll give you the example. Let's say that you rent a house, and... You rent, some, and you, you rent it from some guy, and he gives you a rental agreement. You look through it. You sign a rental agreement. He signs a rental agreement uh, on page 7. That's the last page. And that right there in the boundaries of that piece of paper is the entirety of your agreement with that landlord. Now, after that, you come back a month later, your wife saw a real nice puppy at Walmart. And she says, i got to bring him home, honey. Can you talk to the landlord? Get permission. I know it said in the rental agreement we couldn't have dogs in the house. But he's so cute. So you go to the landlord. Can we have this puppy? Landlord says, well, I guess. Did you know that that is not enforceable? It's not enforceable. Oral agreements do not and cannot alter a written contract, period. It's not, in for, you, and you can go to court, and you can say, I talked to the landlord, and he said it was okay. And the landlord could admit it 
in court. But the oral arrangement never alters a written contract, period. You want it, you want it added to your contract, get it in writing. You hear me? So that means that Joseph Smith was someone who violated the contract that God had made with man by offering them, what, what, what does the Book of Mormon say on it? Another testament of Jesus Christ. Or you can just say, another Jesus Christ. Because if it's another testament, it is a different Jesus. So your contract is not, if you're a Mormon, your contract is not with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your contract is with some other God who used to be a man on a different planet. But that's not the God of this contract. It's a different gospel, a different contract, and a different God. And if you made that agreement, go ahead. But you're going to find out that the real God is not giving you a planet with multiple wives so you can be God over that planet. It's a lie. Amen? Same way with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church cannot override the contract that God made with man in this book. We, listen, we've been hearing this week. We heard it last year at the conference. Catholic Church hates this Bible. Because, and here's, here's what, here's what um, John Wycliffe saw. John Wycliffe saw, even though he was a Catholic priest, he saw the abuses of the Catholic Church to the English people. He saw that those priests, as soon as a man would die, and they still do this. They go to the widow and say, your husband is in purgatory. We can get him out if you give us such and such dollars. That priest knows that that widow does not have that money. So he will steal widows' houses. That's right out of the Bible. He'll say, give us, give us your land, give us all that cattle, give us all those chickens, all those hogs, and all this land. And what we'll do is, that'll get purgatory down, let's say it'll be down to about his waist, but he's still got to suffer for a little while. They still do that to this day. They go after widows' houses. They go to those people and tell them that your loved one is in purgatory right now and we can pray him out and say masses for him, but it's going to cost you. That is not part of the agreement that God offered to mankind. And people buy it. They buy into it. They settle for it. They say, okay, whatever the Catholic priest says, that Catholic priest, nor does the entire Vatican, have the power to override the covenant that God made with man in the form of this Bible. They do not have the authority to override that. Okay? Very, very, neither do these latter-day prophets who are all over YouTube, all over Facebook, all over social media, prophesying things, telling things, oh, God's given me a vision for this, and God's given me... God has, showed, God has said to me these words here. That's a lie. Whatever those words are, they do not alter the written agreement that God has with Mike Hoggard. And I don't accept them. And you shouldn't either. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's your neighbor. I don't care if it's your aunt. I don't care if it's your first cousin. I don't care if it's people you work with. I, I don't, I have no, it doesn't matter who they are. If they're going to add words to this book, they're in danger. They themselves are on very dangerous ground. They can repent, they should repent. But if they don't repent, and they start giving out all these false prophecies everywhere, they're superseding the agreement. Uh, Deuteronomy 27. God even said it in the Old Testament. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say amen. 
What is God saying here? See all these words that I give you? Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Exodus 19, 8, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Do you see that? Moses acting as the mediator. He gives them God's words. The people reply and say, Moses, carry our agreement to God. Moses carried their agreement to God, and God held them accountable. Right then and there. For thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. So while Moses was up on Mount Sinai, and God is graving that very phrase into that stone, what is Aaron doing? Making an image. They were breaking the agreement as God was writing it out. Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. And let me, let me throw this in. Jews right now believe that Moses went to Mount Sinai three times, not two. The Jewish Kabbalah system, Kabbalah means it's been received from God. And the Jewish, those Jewish rabbis in the synagogues right now, they don't even follow the Old Testament. What they did, they follow the rabbis teaching on the Old Testament. They follow the addition to the words, but not the words themselves. They built in loopholes. They built in all kinds of stuff to the law, so they get out, so they get out of it. They can have power over everybody. But they believe that Moses went to Mount Sinai three times. The first two times, he received the written Torah. The third time, he received the oral Torah. In other words... God had words that he never wanted written down. And Moses had this secret doctrine from God that he came down from Mount Sinai with, and he could not tell the whole of the people what that secret doctrine was. He could only tell a very select few of the hierarchy in Israel. And they swore that they would never repeat that except to very select people that after they died, it would be handed down to them and so on and so on. That's what Kabbalah, that's Jewish. Your, your average religious Jew to this day is under that ideology and that system. That God sent down words not written down. And it's a secret from God. You want to see this? Turn to um, Genesis 3. You look at now Satan's attack on God's covenant. Satan's attack on God's covenant. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. First thing he did, question the authenticity and the authority of God's covenant. Because God made a covenant with Adam, did he not? Made a covenant with him. You can have all the trees, including the tree of life, but not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God said to Adam, you could not eat of that tree. Now, he did not say to Adam he couldn't touch it. Eve added that, didn't she? Okay? So, I'm just, you look at it like this. Satan loves to take away from God's word but man loves to add to it. Are you hearing me? So you're going to find people on social media who will say things to you that make you believe that what they say, that if you, if you go against what they say, that's a sin, and God's going to hold you accountable for it. They will add all kinds of burdens to you that are not in the Bible. And I want to tell you something. God knew what he was doing when he gave us this book. If it's a sin, 
It's in this book. If God doesn't care if you do it, then he didn't write it down as a transgression or a commandment in this book. Are you with me? Okay? And, and their religious fundamentalism always adds things that God never said in his word as sins and burdens to mankind. If you do these things, well, then obviously you're not saved. If you don't do these things, obviously you're not saved. You're transgressing against God. Well, where is that in the Bible? It's not there. And if the law doesn't condemn you, don't let anybody else condemn you, nor condemn yourself. We got enough to worry about with what's written in here. Okay? I, I, I'm going to say this. Think about the Amish people. I mean, they're fine folks, I guess. They look nice. Okay? But where did God say you couldn't use electricity? Where did God say that? Where did God say that you couldn't use certain machineries? God never said that. That's not in God's word. And if it's not in God's word, it is not a transgression. It's not a sin. Sin, according to the Bible, is a transgression of what? The law. And the law here is written. You wouldn't put up with a police officer who pulled you over and tried to arrest you. It's like you would not put up with a cop who tried to arrest you on something that you knew was not illegal. If, it's, if they arrest you, they have to give you, they can put you in jail. But if they're going to charge you with something, they have to give you a writ of habeas corpus. In other words, why are we keeping your corpse? Okay? Why are we holding your body? And they must put it in writing what you did wrong and what law you broke. That put it down in writing. And if it's not in writing, and if it's not, if that's the law of this land. Police can't hold you if they cannot find that you did, if they can't prove that you did something wrong, they cannot hold you. You see what I'm saying? In other countries, cops can arrest you for whatever they want. In communist dictatorships, they arrest people all the time simply on the suspicion that they might be anti-communist. And they can hold them there indefinitely. Put them in those gulags. Put them in those prisons. That's what the kind of stuff they get away with all the time. We don't do that. Or we shouldn't do that in America. It's not our way. You see what I'm saying? Don't let anybody add to your life transgressions that they say you must do or not do. Period. The end. Okay? So I'm done with that. Let's move on. The papacy, adding to the word of God, adding to the covenant, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Latter-day Prophecies or New Revelations from quote-unquote God. The bottom line is, God didn't say it if he didn't say it in this book. When Je I make this point over and over. When Jesus comes, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. He's not stepping outside of the bounds of God's word. And it's not just in Catholic church, not just in the Mormon church. It is in the new churchism of today where they're saying that the Bible is a boundary that God does not accept. That God is bigger than the Bible that you hold in your hand. And if you believe in this this idea that God's got to stick to the Bible, well, then you're nuts. They're, you're a kook. You're a, you're a pagan. You're an idol worshiper. You're worshiping the Bible. Our God is bigger than the Bible. Then your God is not my God. We do not have the same Father, and I did not make a contract with your God. And just think about it. If you think you're serving a God that will not abide by the terms of His Word, you're serving a liar. 
Why would, why would you serve a God like that? Why would you serve a God who can then make up on a whim the terms for your salvation? Why would you follow that? Any preacher, teacher, blogger, book, video, etc. that adds or takes away from or changes the text of the Bible. This includes all new translations. They add to or take away from the words. And they say, well, that doesn't really alter the, the major doctrines of the Bible. It is a lie. If they've taken something out, they did it for a reason. Whoever wrote the Vaticanus, which is one of the Greek texts that underlies all of the modern Bible translations, whoever wrote that document, it is obvious that they hated the real Bible in the real New Testament, that they had serious issues with Jesus being God Almighty. They had serious issues with it. They did not believe it. So they sought about in many, numerous, thousands of places in the text of the New Testament to remove instances where Jesus can be seen as deity. They took it out. More, uh, I'll give you an example. Turn to, um, turn to uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. Who can, with their tablet or something like that, go to blueletterbible.org and look up the NIV for 1 Timothy 3.16. Who can do that? Anybody? You got tablets here. Go to blueletterbible.org. Okay. Select NIV. And go to 1 Timothy. I can't even find 1 Timothy in my King James. Hang on. 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 Timothy 3.16. I'm in 2 Thessalonians. Hoggard, get with the program here. I'm in 2 Thessalonians. Here we go. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who was manifest in the flesh? God was. So 1 Timothy 3.16 in the NIV says what? He. Who? He appeared in a body, or he appeared in the. Did it say appeared in the flesh or appeared in a body? They've they've changed it. I've got it in my notes from former NIVs where they had he appeared in a body. So now they've updated even their own Bible, but they still didn't get it. Their Greek text does not say that God was manifest in the flesh. Therefore, they did not translate God was manifest in the flesh. They said, He appeared in the flesh. He. But it does not signify who. I do not accept that contractual change. I do not accept that contractual change. The contract that I agreed to was God was manifest in the flesh. That's what I agreed to. That's what I was saved under. And I do not accept those changes. God did not make those changes. Man did. Man made them. Man thinks that he can alter God's covenant. And I'm going to go one more here. God's covenant is in every cell in your body. Your DNA. That was what was given you to give you life. God does not allow for the alteration of the words of that book. He's the one that wrote it. He's the one that gave it to you. And God does not consent to the changes that they're wanting to make in people's DNA. Don't fall for it. Father in heaven, this word is firm. 
It's static. It's inalterable. It's unmovable. It is unchangeable. It is incorruptible. It is pure in everything that it says. And Father, we agree that this covenant comes directly from heaven. We agree to it. We consent to it. We give our amen to it. We, we, give, we give our very life and our blood for it. And you, Father, you have given us the earnest of your spirit, signifying to us that we are, in fact, sons of God. We have the spirit of your Son in us, crying, Abba, Father. We recognize, God, that we are your children. You are our God. And you have given us these great and precious promises and written to us that we may know that we have eternal life. And Father, we thank you for what was written. And even Pontius Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. And he wasn't about to change it. And neither are you. Father, help us in these very dark days that we live in. Father, help us to not be put under the burdens of someone else writing out new transgressions, new sins that are not recorded in your word. Father, help us, Father, to take our stand in the liberty wherewith you have made us free. And Father, even our constitution in this country is our government's contract with us. We do not consent to any alteration to that covenant or contract. We do not consent to any authority in government that would violate the Constitution. We wouldn't stand for it. And Father, we're not standing for any change in your word either. We thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, that you sealed it. We thank you that you signed it. You've written it in, in your own blood, and we thank you for that. Father, thank you for the life that you've given us through this word. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Don't fall for it.